I'm Tom Friedman. I'm the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. And with me here in, at center stage are uh, Frank Fredericks, who uh, is from the um, World Faith, a global movement of interfaith youth uh, tackling uh, global poverty and other issues. Uh, we have Bonnie Dougal from the Baha'i community. We have uh, Ali Ibrahim from uh, Pakistan and the Muslim faith. And uh, uh, Matthew Ricard um, uh, from Buddhist monk who living in France. And um, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So it's a treat to be with you all. Uh, I represent the Minnesota Jewish community, um, uh, <laughs> also known as the Frozen Chosen. Okay, so um, uh, so I'll do my best to keep this flowing. Now, if you've done any panels that I've moderated, you know it's nothing about you. It's all about me. Okay, so um, <laughs> that is. Uh, I'm really, you are just props here to serve my next column, okay, so. Um, <clears throat> so this is not strictly off the record. This is not, this, no, there's no Chatham House, there's nothing here, okay. Uh, not, not really, but um, uh, there's a story that, uh, I want to begin with a question posed to all of you, but it really is um, a story I found myself retelling 20 years later, lately. Um, and it, uh, it really goes to the, I've, I've been writing books since 1988, and so I've been on book tour for on and off for 30 years. And in 1999, I got the best question I have ever gotten then or since on book tour. And it was in Portland, Oregon. I was out, I'd written a book called Lexus and the Olive Tree. And a young man stood up in the balcony during question time, and he said, Mr. Friedman, I have a question for you. Is God in cyberspace? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, is God in cyberspace? Is God in cyberspace? Yeah. And I said, wow, I've, I've never been asked that question before. Is God in cyberspace? I said, I, 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 I don't know. I really hate being asked a question I don't know. So I, I got home. I called uh, my spiritual leader. His name is Rabbi Tzvi Marks. He lives in Amsterdam. I said, Tzvi, I was out on book tour. Young man stood up and said, is God in cyberspace? What, what should I have said? And he said, well, Tom, you know, in our faith tradition, we have actually two concepts of the Almighty. One is that he is the Almighty. So he smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace because it's full of pornography, gambling, <laughs> bad talk, um, uh, people uh, trashing one another. So, um, but he said, we actually have a competing view of the Almighty. And that is that God manifests himself by how we behave. And so if we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. And God will only be in cyberspace depending on how we behave. So I want to begin with that question. Uh, how would, and I called any of the five of you from your different faiths, start with you, Mr. Fredericks, just go around. What would you have said, is God in cyberspace? Well, if God is in cyberspace, then I really need to clear my search history. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what I would say is, you know, this is not really in the realm of my work uh, on trying to end religious space violence, but what I think is it's really interesting to see how people bring their preconceived ideas and notions of what they believe their faith calls them to into this space. And sometimes mm. it's beautiful. I've, been, I, I've seen uh, more examples of... of different practices from around the world that I don't have access to in, in New York uh, through, let's say, YouTube and these different channels. Hmm. But many times, people are using this technology to engage and recruit young people to do terrible things. Yeah. And not every terrible thing is extreme violence. Mm -hmm. We have those examples. But sometimes it's as simple as just writing things that are diminutive to people based mm -hmm. on the race or on, on gender. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, as you said, I think we, it's up to what we bring into it. What I would say is that we sort of live in Marsh McLuhan's dream. Even though Marsh McLuhan died in 83, he sort of created a framework of us to understand that we're more greatly impacted by the media we consume, right, and, and, how, it, and, and how it works in our brains. But that kind of ends now with my generation and the generation after us, because we're the first generation to be more greatly impacted by being media producers the media consumers. Hmm, interesting. Uh, so I think that it's no longer the medium is the message, but the message is the medium. Hmm. Uh, and I hope you know, we can bring in a, a good side of God's message through this new uh, world we live in. That's very good. I'm going to steal that. That's very good. I like that. Um, I'm playing a right um, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Ibrahim, yeah. Yeah, what would I, you have said? I, I think uh, uh, I would have said, God is where we are, and God is where we are not. 
Hmm. So I, I think cyberspace is pretty well captured there. And at the same time, uh, what we see is, in our faith particularly, uh, God's attributes are manifested in us, some of them. Mm -hmm. So in Quran, we, we know that there are like 99 attributes which are identified to us, and there are so many others which are not identified to us. Mm -hmm. And perhaps those are the ones that perhaps our human consciousness cannot uh, comprehend. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, every attribute of God that is manifested in us that has an anti to that as well. So that as you, uh, as you alluded to that, the, the negative part. So Obviously, wherever we are, those 99 attributes of God, which are manifested, which are present, at the same time, the other ones as well. Mm -hmm. So I think I would have said pretty much what, what you actually answered. Interesting. Yeah. That's great. Ms. Dugal. So uh, <clears throat> I think of God as a prayer-answering, loving God, and he's everywhere. He's omniscient. Um, in terms of uh, cyberspace, I mean, Mankind is created to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization, and if cyberspace is going to be a means to that, then yes, I think he's, he's there too. Um, hopefully not in the negative aspects mm. of cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Mr. Richard. Well, I must say that's not the kind of first question that comes to me in mind when I wake up in the morning, <laughs> and uh, for several reasons. <laughs> First, it seems a bit odd, you know, you could ask, is God in the atomic bomb or in the Holocaust mm -hmm. or whatever? And also, you know, in Buddhism, we don't have the same view of uh, That's the, I'm the first cause and the mm -hmm. creator. But, you know, you get confronted with this odd question. Yesterday, in one of our meetings, there was someone, uh, someone from Beijing who said, now we have a, a Buddhist monk that delivers, uh, a robot that delivers teachings. I said, great, you know, go back to the hermitage, we don't <laughs> need to do anything anymore. <laughs> but then I was thinking, you know, what are you looking uh, into God or spirituality or Buddhahood? Isn't it like uh, even that monk robot, uh, you know, doesn't, it helps others? Do, can you speak of love and compassion? Uh, even that robot doesn't display jealousy or greed. Can you speak of inner freedom? Uh, even that robot, uh, you know, doesn't harm and all that. You know, so I mean, this is all about <laughs> You know, the most uh, deepest experience that we seek in spirituality or religion. So in a way, cyberspace is like a tool like any other. Mm -hmm. It can be used to harm or to do good, to destroy mm -hmm. or to build. So mm -hmm. that's all. Sounds good. Archbishop. <laughs> I'm tempted to say every time I'm around uh, on the underground in London or, or on a bus or in, in an office, I hear someone looking at their computer or their phone and saying, oh, God, why is this not working? <laughs> so. Oh, that's so good. That was, that was worth coming here for. That was good. <laughs> so uh, that, that would indicate yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think from a, a strictly Christian oh, great, yes. point of view, um, sorry, that's my Jewish heritage <laughs> right, coming yeah. out. <laughs> from, a, from a strictly Christian point of view, um, we start as Christians with, and we just celebrated, the idea that Jesus Christ uh, is God and that he was born in a manger in poverty as a refugee in suffering and, uh, and that he died on a cross in suffering. And uh, if that's where you start in your faith, then uh, you say that God is in the midst of all things good and bad that he's involved in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So yes. Great, well thank you very much. Um, so one of the things I hear when I come to Europe is churches are empty. One thing I hear from all faith leaders when I go around America today is uh, young people don't want to join anything. Don't want to join a church, synagogue, mosque. They don't want to pay dues. They want everything a la carte. I refer to my own rabbi as Rabbi Airbnb, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, because uh, everybody just wants it when they want it, how they want it, um, but um, the tradition of my parents' generation, which you affiliate with the local church, whatever your faith is, or mosque, or synagogue, or temple, whatever. Um, you pay dues, you sustain the congregation. That's not happening. How, how is that affecting all of you? What is the, the status of, of your ability to bring in a new generation? How is this millennial generation different? I see signs all over here about what millennials do. I, don't know, you know, is, is, is where religion fits into that. Mr. Fredericks, start us off. Sure. Uh, as 
maybe the only millennial. I don't want to age anyone. Uh, I, I can say it's really interesting to be in these conversations working in a faith space and engaging with religious institutions. Um, when we founded World Faith, and we were pushing out to see how we could uh, create models to end religious-based violence, we started by engaging with religious leaders as a method. And what we found is it wasn't as effective to reach young people for two reasons. Number one, because many times religious leaders and institutions were so concerned about they're barely being able to keep together their own faith. Why are we going to introduce them to people from other faiths? You know, mm. and this is, a, 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 I understand, research, research yeah. shows otherwise that actually your faith deepens when you meet people different than yourself. Hmm. But this fear was there. But secondly, also that young people are not really engaging with religious institutions anymore yeah. the way that they used to. And part of this, I think, comes from this issue, once again, very McLuhan-like neuroplasticity that our brains are rewired by the way we consume media. And our current iteration, at least I can talk as a Christian in the evangelical tradition, that our churches still function as they did in the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. You dress up, you go to a building, you do these things you, with these people, you are a media consumer in There's that room. There's a sage on the stage. Just like yeah, a movie yeah, theater was right. you know, back in, in maybe in the 1940s or something. Mm -hmm. uh, we went from the movie theater to Netflix, and yet we're still trying to use the same model in religious uh, institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one big problem. I think the second problem is, look, Religion isn't inherently a democracy for, for most traditions. Uh, Baha'i, a tradition aside, because I, I really actually love the structure of the Baha'i um, international community. But um, it's, it, it's not a democracy in the sense that you, if people vote, you know. So I understand that there's this issue of moral authority in saying what is or isn't right. On the same token, I also vote with my, my butt on where, what I will or will not accept you know, to, be con to be related with. Um, my wife's Muslim. Um, mm -hmm. We had a rabbi who actually did the ceremony. Hmm. Um, her stepfather is Baha'i, and she grew hmm. up in an interfaith family. You could have done the whole panel, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, yeah. Chris, Christmas gets real interesting, because yeah. my wife actually likes most of the, I like the religious traditions, and yeah. she likes the songs and the tree, and <laughs> the whole thing just gets confusing. <laughs> a Muslim who loves it, yeah, anyway. So that's the reality I live in. My team uh, of uh, people working in interfaith issues, about half my team is LGBT of, of some kind. Hmm. Now, how can I go to a building, and, and as an evangelical, I still call myself that, but go into a community where that is not my theology? Now, I'm not saying they can't have that theology. That's, they're welcome to that. That's part right. of their moral authority. But as a millennial who also feels sovereign and ability, ability yeah. to make my own framework, I really believe I cannot do that in good conscience. I cannot give my money. I cannot spend my time hmm. at a community that is diminutive to my family, to my closest friends, to my staff. Um, that's, I just, I can't do that. What we can do though, where millennials are still engaged, in America this is quite fascinating, one in every three millennial is non-religious, and only 22% of millennials are t attending weekly religious services. That means the majority of millennials are religiously identifying, but not participating mm -hmm. with an institution. Hmm. Uh, and I think the opportunity there is what can we accomplish together? Because when we're doing volunteer projects, whether in Nigeria or whether we're, we're working in schools in India, and this is all happening locally, or even in the United States, working with the homeless population, people from different religions will come together to do this work through the shared value service. Also, atheists and humanist and agnostic people will come and participate in this. Because ultimately, as the world becomes more diverse, like my own life has shown that this is happening, mm -hmm. Uh, we cannot solve any of our problems if we can't work across faith communities and not just tolerate each other. I tolerate back pain. You can't tolerate somebody from another faith. Mm -hmm. Not just tolerate or coexist, but collaborate and achieve something that we uniquely couldn't do otherwise. That's what I believe this generation uh, and faith is going to be about. Terrific. Thank you. Oh, how would you answer that? Um, <clears throat> I, I would think, uh, let's say, uh, I don't have the exact numbers at how many millennials are Muslims, but uh, going by 2.5 billion millennials today, as we <coughs> as we see, one, which is one third of the population. So, if we take that, 1.7 billion uh, Muslims, and one third of that, it's it's a it's a phenomenal <coughs> size. But at the same time, what we see in the Muslim world, the mosques are not really empty; they're always overfilled, mm. and and but that also uh, raises a point uh, that faith is relevant in their life. Yes, absolutely. But whether faith is inspiring them to do something in life or not, I think there's a big question mark. And I would think faith is not perhaps able to inspire them to do much with their life. Although, uh, being Muslim, everything I do in life uh, has a direct connection with my faith. That whether I, I, I'm a shopkeeper, or I'm a school teacher, or I'm a banker, it's, it's part of my worship. Because the part of worship is that if, if I do it good, it's part of worship. If I don't do it good, it, it's not worship. So somehow or the other, there is a, bis, a big disconnect. And I, I see that perhaps happening pretty recently. And uh, previously, 
they were more inspirations like, uh, let, let me give you an example of uh, Pope Francis. Uh, he has inspired and touched so many people in every age and, and also uh, uh, millennials. And, and, and I, I'm not saying that I'm a millennial. When, when I met with him and I had the honor to, to, to meet with him, the first thing I told him that I'm, I'm a devout Muslim and I'm deeply inspired by his message of uh, 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 poverty alleviation and against the human suffering. And that is something that, that he has been trying to, to actually uh, perhaps uh, redevelop the narrative that how religious leaders or faith leaders need to need to engage with because the real uh, real issues of the of the society. So the countries that where I live in or I come from, the context is absolutely different. The the context is at most times survival. So look at Southeast Asia the uh, and South Asia the, the the extreme poverty is absolutely manifested there. So the survival is the most important thing. So the economic development is the, is the most critical challenge. Whether faith has done enough on that, yes and no. Because if you see Muslims, Muslims are, 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 are obliged to give 2.5% of their, of their wealth every year. And that makes it a, a humongous amount. But that has just not been institutionalized. And perhaps that is the reason that lack of institu institutionalization of giving is not creating much impact. Well, let me go back to that point. I think you, you began with a very interesting dichotomy, masterful. But young people don't seem to be inspired. How do you explain that? I, I think the role models uh, are, are missing. And mm. uh, let me go back to South Asia again, because yeah. that, that's where well, I, my, my most yeah. of the history is. So uh, in the subcontinent, uh, the, the people like, uh, like 700 years ago, 800 years ago, <coughs> when Islam made its way, uh, I'll give you an example of uh, one uh, uh, Ali Hajwari. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was a saint, Sufi saint. Mm -hmm. uh, people have a different version uh, of, of uh, Sufis, but people have a uh, different opinion about them. But be as it may, he was one person that who came and inspired so many people uh, in, the, in the whole region that even after he passed away, now 700 or 800 years after that, the, there was something that he did for the, the, the people who used to sell milk. Mm -hmm. And in those ag agricultural societies, you know how deeply entrenched milk is uh, is a survival tool. And, and he, he helped some, some uh, milk owners. And then uh, now what happens is the, the date of his anniversary, when he passed away, there is no milk available in the entire region. All mm -hmm. the milk comes to his shrine, and that is distributed for charity. Mm -hmm. And that has been happening for the last 700 years. And that is not the only example. There is an uh, Khwaja Garib Nawaz of India. And his shrine has been there for, for uh, 700 years as well. And guess who? Muslims are not, not the only ones who go there. Hindus go there. Sikhs go there. So you're saying there's these people in the past who are inspiring. Exactly. But there aren't current models. They are not current models. Why not? I, I, and I, I've seen uh, some current models as well, where I grew up in Kashmir. Right. I've, I've seen some people, uh, particularly a person who started uh, a, a whole educational uh, 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 system with the mosque, he created single-handedly 700 mosques. He changed the entire surface mm. of, of that area in Kashmir where I, I, I came up from. But he was, he was doing it on himself. But those examples are not really enough. Mm. So I, I think now the time is that uh, perhaps religion is being perceived as, as, uh, as a symbol of identification, which actually implies that we are separate. So as long as religion is not being perceived as a symbol of unity, I think the, the impact of scale that is really needed today is not likely to happen. Ms. Bigo, what, what's so happening in the Baha'i world? Well, I think um, young people all over in all faiths are a lot more inspired by the possibility of contributing to the spiritual and material well-being of their communities rather than you know, sitting in a congregation, as it were. Mm -hmm. They see themselves as having a role to play. And, and we believe that uh, the purpose of religion is to unleash this uh, capacity, this human capacity mm -hmm. for, uh, you know. Justice. To, for justice yeah. and for, uh, for con mm -hmm. making contribution. a contribution. Mm -hmm. and, um, and young people see themselves as protagonists in their own development and that of mm -hmm. other people, be they young or old. And uh, the Baha'i community has been uh, engaged in this process of learning together, young and old. And uh, How many Baha'i followers are there in the world? How um, big is the community? Between six and seven million. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a widespread yeah. religion in all countries, s mm -hmm. small groups, but um, an active community. Mm -hmm. so, so we find, uh, you know, I mean... The so you're appealing to a different uh, aspiration. I mean... 
very it's much. It's really what Mr. Frederick said. We don't want to just come and sit um, in, in our house of worship. We want to be engaged uh, in a in higher purpose. In making a difference, mm -hmm. exactly, making a difference in the world. Interesting. And contributing to an ever advancing civilization, mm -hmm. however they perceive that yeah. and where the need is, and, and uh, recognizing the need and making a difference. And that every human being has the potential to do that. Mm. Um, we don't believe that you know a small group of people are responsible for the well-being right. of the mm -hmm. seven billion so people on, yeah. Great. That's on this interesting. side. Yeah. Matthew. Yeah, there was, there was a few points about the religion a la carte. You know, when I was doing the research for the altruism, the book on altruism, I look at the contrary forces. One of them is, uh, you know, the, epidemi the narcissistic epidemic. So individualism, I think, is a really a, a drive for religion a la carte. And I, while doing the research, I came on the extreme case, which is Shilaism. So there's a lady called Shaila. She started that. And when you ask her what is the religion is about, she says, it's about me. So that's the ultimate a la carte religion, the only one, and it's about me. Sounds like something I would start. So that's actually. the, you know, the <laughs> top of the individualism. <laughs> now about uh, crisis of faith and attending. Again, we're a little bit different in, yeah. the, in the East. Uh, we have a monastery which has 600 monks, and it's a small one. And every year we refuse plenty of young people. And it's paradoxical because Buddhism doesn't try to convert people into proselytism. I was uh, in December with the Dalai Lama in South India. We were meeting with scientists in a place where then within 10 kilometers you have 20 monasteries, 10,000 monks and nuns. So in the street, is, you know, it's a different uh, sort of atmosphere. So, and then the more important question, I think, of role models. You know, in my life, half a century in the Himalayas was all inspired by people who actually embody what lies at the end of the path. You know, whatever I can imagine of human perfection or spiritual perfection, I could not see any, you know, after many years, you know, how, okay, it looks good, but there's some big problem behind, you know. With the Dalai Lama, I've been sh uh, happy to be his interpreter for 20 years. It's exactly the same with the lady who cleans the room in the hotel and with the president. It's a human being, no difference, mm -hmm. private, public. So that's highly encouraging. When the messengers become the message, then you say, okay, if I do with determined effort to try to become a better human being through the means of spirituality, transforming myself to better serve others, you know, there's something that works because I, I see it in front of my eyes and it's a constant inspiration. Like, you know, the, the North Pole for the, the needle of the compass, mm. it always brings you back to what is right. So mm. I think the role model is so important. And when that's lost, people say, no, look at that. And the fact that religion sometimes has been used as flags for, you know, separating people, of, you know, of uniting them, I think that's, a, you know, sometimes bringing more, more harm than good. That that's also a, a message or something that young people might feel, you know, they don't turn to religion to, to solve you know, problem about bringing peace and so forth. They say, oh, you are making the problem. Why should we turn to you for looking mm. for peace? Do people at the forum here um, come up and engage you? You're obviously of the Buddhist faith. And well, I guess they like or, the colors, you know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious, do people come and ask you things? or uh, are well, they Plenty. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm, I guess it's the same with everyone. And... Uh, well, yes, you know, I'm trying to just be open and ready and mm -hmm. available. <laughs> Readiness is one thing which you can be as a simple Buddhist monk, you know, be at the service and whatever. Archbishop, anybody coming to church these days? Depends where you are. Mm -hmm. um, in the Church of England, in England, uh, since 1945, we've gone down on average by just over 1% every year in church attendance. I think you'd probably say that wasn't entirely successful. Well, um, that, that brings it to about 70%. Uh, yeah, it's not far off that. Mm. Um, by contrast, uh, if you look at our um, churches in sub-Saharan Africa, and in England, the average age of church attendance in the Church of England is in the early 60s. If you go to sub-Saharan Africa, you get the average Anglican, which is a woman mm -hmm. uh, in her 30s, living on less than $4 a day. That's the mm -hmm. average Anglican globally. Why, why that cohort? What's going on there? <laughs> if I knew that, we'd probably be doing better in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, there are number of things there. There is a very strong sense of community, and I think it comes back. I'm very struck by particularly what Mathieu and, and Frank have said, that, that there are a number of things in um, the 
pervasive sense of individualism which takes away from people the commitment to serving and belonging with one another, which perhaps that sense of community is, has been retained. Mm. I think I'd say two other things that seem to me to be very important. One is less boundaries. We need less boundaries. Mm. Uh, religions of uh, most of the classic religions spend most of their time telling people what they should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, we need much more of a sort of uh, open hosp hospitality, a sense of welcome and allowing people to be who they are, mm. but to be conformed by the spirit of God whom we worship. So rather than us telling them this is what your life should be shaped by, we bring them face to face with God and the Spirit of God changes them. And, and, when, and when you see that, I've seen it in churches in which I've ministered, and then when that happens, you see the church grows, even in England, quite significantly and very rapidly. The second thing is um, more challenge. Um, you know, there's an old story of a guy showing his, uh, a dad showing his son around uh, an Anglican church and there's the list of people who were killed in the Second World War and, and, and the father says, ah yes, uh, Jack, those are, the, um, those are the people who died in the services. And he says, do you mean the morning service or the <laughs> evening <laughs> service? <laughs> and, you know, the, and there is, you know, the, there's someone else, I think it was an American, I think it was, actually it was, it was um, um, uh, one of your great authors um, said, if you laid all the people uh, down end to end who fell asleep in services, they'd be a lot more comfortable. You know, it, it's, it's, um, there is that sense yeah. that we bring in people in and we don't challenge them, we just put them in rows right. and tell them what to do. We started 18 but months ago, we advertised uh, for 16 people to come and live in a quasi-monastic uh, discipline for a year at Lambeth Palace where I live and work. Um, and to come, come, and it would be rigorous, it'd be immensely demanding, they'd work with the poor, they would find it tiring, difficult, challenging, and we had 500 applications for mm. the 16 places. Interesting. That really is a common Fewer theme boundaries here about how people really want to, be, want to be engaged. Let me go back the other way and, and, and start with you. Um, you know, Barack Obama ran for president um, on the platform that marriage was a union between a man and a woman. He will finish his term um, having advocated and ushered, help usher into American law that, uh, as he said in the State of the Union uh, just last week, that marriage is the union between any two human beings who love each other. And uh, he will be doing that following Ireland, uh, who uh, beat him and, and America to that punch. How does the embrace of the LGBT movement challenge your faiths? Thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> nice weather we've been having, yeah, would you say? I'd like you? to hear my sermons Good. of Leviticus. Yes. <laughs> um, I think I'd say um, <laughs> it's, it's a massive challenge. And last week we had a gathering of the 38 uh, senior archbishops of, of the 38 Anglican provinces from around the world of, who oversee between them <coughs> have responsibility for about 80 million Christians. And you had every view from those strongly in favor of same-sex marriage to those who felt it should be a crime. Hmm. So I sat for a yeah. week, we sat for a week working together on this. Two things came out. One depending on where you are in the world, you will take a totally different view. This is what you've described as the view in Europe, North America, mm -hmm. but not Absolutely. in many other places. That's right. Secondly, it's easy. The historic Christian teaching, which personally I hold to, is that, um, uh, is that marriage is a lifelong union between a man and a woman. That doesn't answer your question because then what do you do with people who find themselves attracted to people of their own gender? And were and attracted to your church. And attracted to your church. And the, what we're saying is, A, you don't tell them to push off. B, you absolutely don't say that they should be criminalized. C, you welcome them hospitably. 
and you engage in listening. And what we're doing in the Church of England, we are going through an endless process of, mm. rightly, of listening and apologizing. And I did this at the end of the conference last week for the terrible way that often the church has treated LGBT people, mm. LGBTI people, uh, and that we've demeaned them, we've been cruel, we've excluded them, we've behaved disgustingly and totally contrary to what you see in the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. So you have particular, and, and Pope Francis said this last week, uh, he said, you know, the church has to say that it thinks some things are right, some things are wrong. But that doesn't mean that we, uh, we don't then engage with the people with whom we disagree. Quite the reverse. Jesus, the biggest accusation people brought against Jesus was he mixed with the wrong people. I would really like to be accused of that myself. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Matthew. Well, it seems that I always have the easiest position. <laughs> because You're making a lot of converts here. No, <laughs> not of <I> belief. <laughs> because we don't have a, a sacrament for marriage in Buddhism. There's no <laughs> such thing. <laughs> so no problem. Yeah, interesting. No, <laughs> <laughs> what can happen is, you know, they make a big feast. Yes, yeah. And they might call a lama to give a long life ceremony. Uh -huh. And uh, we just go by the golden rule. If Provided you don't harm anyone, good for you. So mm. we don't have such problems. <laughs> Neither for divorce, not for... <laughs> so basically, the real fundamental of ethics, which is of course the same, is do no harm. And besides that, you know, it's up to everyone to abide by the ethics or the way of life they want. So. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks oh, to just you. to come back Please. to the role model, I forgot to yeah. say, emphasize about the Pope Francis. I think why we all feel so enthusiastic, and I'm getting his, all his books as soon as they come out, or listening to what he says, is precisely because he, was, he walks the talk. And not only because of what he says. But Save I've that thought, because I want to go to that later. Okay. Okay? Save that sure. thought. That's going to be my next question. Ms. Dupin. So we believe in the human rights of all people to live the way they wish to live. But as far as marriage and the Baha'i faith, it's between a man and a woman. And um, that's how it is. And uh, mm -hmm. you have... Um, what happens you, when young Baha'is um, uh, who are gay, lesbian, um, how, how do they, what do they do? Honestly, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, the, becoming a Baha'i is a choice. You, you, mm -hmm. You're not born what, into uh -huh. the faith. Interesting. So at the age of 15, a child, if he's born or she's born to Baha'i Baha parents, parents uh -huh. makes a choice as to whether they're going to uh -huh. uh, be a Baha'i. Sign on to the rules. Exactly. Interesting. And uh, so I guess it's a difficult choice for someone mm. who may uh, be gay. Yeah. But um, it's a choice for them to make. And then again, we, we don't have clergy. We don't have anyone standing in judgment. Mm -hmm. So it's really between you and God. Interesting. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Professor Ibrahim. Yeah. Um, I think Muslim societies generally are, are, are very conservative. And, and these issues are not openly talked about. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't really have enough information or whether this is. Uh, Haven't developed a, a, a the theocratic response, I mean, generally at all? I, I haven't, I haven't yeah. come across any. I have a, uh, and even I haven't come across any, uh, any public uh, outreach mm -hmm. for, for mm. seeking such a response from the clergy. Mm. I, I think primarily be, uh, because of the reason, the context where, the, where Islam is being practiced most of the time, the issues, and there are multiple issues, and some of the issues are really, really critical, as, as he said, survival, sure. poverty, lack of uh, health facilities, lack of schooling, lack of, <laughs> lack of education, lack of employment. People literally, you know, living in a small box, you know, all, entire family. Yeah. So, you know, we, we it, it, I, I don't think it, it would be very fair to, to assume that they, they are uh, talking about these issues because They're not. those people are uh, uh, seeking much more uh, uh, from, from the clergy and from, the, from mm -hmm. the faith to come and help and to be relevant in their lives. Mm -hmm. So I, I really want to, to come to and connect with that point that you, you put on hold for a Yeah, well, I'm going to give you the next question. Yeah, yeah. But what do young gay Muslim women and men and women do? Just completely uh, live in, I think in a the closet? Religious, religiously speaking, the little I know, I'm no authority yeah. on, on religion, sure. but I, I think uh, really, like Islam uh, covers the subject of the entire life. So uh, sexual uh, part of life is absolutely covered as well. And then the, the, uh, 
the injunctions on sexual behavior are also very clear. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that you know that any interpretation has come out that how how to deal with the Quranic injunctions on, mm -hmm. uh, on on gay and lesbian rights. Mm -hmm. We we haven't seen that as yet. So but at the same time, if if we take it uh, uh, on its face, um, every human being is sacred. Every the life of every uh, Muslim mm -hmm. is sacred. So life of every living being is sacred. Mm -hmm. I think that is the that, starting that is, point. That is a starting mm -hmm. point. And I think that is the ultimate point as well. So all of these things have to be seen under, underneath mm -hmm. that. Frank. So I have uh, an answer as a Christian and an answer as a person doing interfaith work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say something that's not popular in the evangelical community, mm -hmm. um, but I will not stop talking about equality for LGBT people in my community mm -hmm. until not only the community is at a place where they accept and bring in, but actually completely affirm LGBT people legally, socially, and every aspect mm -hmm. of life. Um, I believe that is my moral obligation. Um, the reason for that is uh, it's not just a matter of being progressive or millennial and the humanization I've gone through by meeting and engaging with people in the LGBT community, but there are theological questions we should have about marriage in the Christian tradition. Um, if you look at the earliest forms of, of biblical you know, marriage in, in Judaism, mm -hmm. it was pretty much a property transfer from a father mm -hmm. to the son. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of, you know, even modern day, the thing we all seem to agree on is two consenting adults, right? Biblical marriage was none of those things. There's not two. There's many times we'd have multiple wives. Um, consent was not a thing for a lot of it, uh, which is why issues like uh, a victim of a rape would, if the, the rapist married her, he, you know, be forgiven because the value of uh, virginity mm. was more than her sovereignty as a human. Mm. Um, and, or, or even um, you, you, you go through history, um, people use biblical cases against uh, interracial marriage. I'm in an inter-ethnic interracial marriage, interfaith mm -hmm. marriage as mm. well. Mm. In 19, uh, Loving versus Virginia was not that long ago. Mm. Uh, and what so was that? Love, uh, Loving versus Virginia was a Supreme Court case that basically said no, you, no state can make a law against interracial marriage. And that was 1968? Hmm. Uh, it was something like that. Yeah. That's, to me, is shocking, right? So marriage has changed. The theology that we use to support our defini uh, definition of marriage has changed. So as a person uh, of faith in my faith community, I will continue to advocate in theological terms towards that end until we, we reach it. Um, now, there's the important part about my role isn't primarily as a, a leader in the evangelical movement. It's doing interfaith work mm -hmm. and ending religi religious-based violence and getting young people to work in development mm -hmm. projects to reduce poverty. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to that, many of our partners, we're working in Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. many of our partners, our volunteers, uh, organizations that work with us, do not agree with my theology. That's the beautiful thing about doing interfaith work and interfaith mm -hmm. collaboration, is that we may disagree, we may disagree on these issues, but we all believe that we're supposed to take care of the world, to take care of people, and, and we connect and work with a lot of these types of institutions and people to go on the shared value of service to reduce poverty and reduce violence. And I think that's, I think that's more important, mm -hmm. and, and it, we should never preclude and not sit down at the table to accomplish something where we can agree and can collaborate. So that's a good segue to my next question, which is, um, uh, you know, the Pope came to America um, several months ago, Pope Francis, and uh, my wife and I happened to be in New York, and we happened to be staying at the Essex House on Central Park uh, the day he drove through Central Park, and we had his schedule and whatnot, and, um, uh, <coughs> and we climbed up actually on the window ledge in our room to see if, we actually sat there for a half hour to see if we could get a glimpse of him. Why? the amazing appeal of this man. I agree with Matthew because he, what you see is what you get. Um, he has a, an absolutely coherently thought through understanding of what life is about and what the human being is about particularly, the dignity of the human being. And he applies it rigorously uh, and consistently with humor and with joy uh, and with celebration of what human beings are uh, in an institution where, like all historic institutions, there's pressures to conform to different patterns. And he doesn't conform, he changes the institutions being changed by him rather than him being changed by the institution. And I think we look at that and you see in, for me, I see in him the presence and reality of Jesus Christ in this world. And uh, I find 
uh, both when I've met him in private and when I've uh, seen him uh, in public, uh, that is hugely and amazingly attractive. I mean, I read his uh, encyclical on climate. Yeah, very good. That was the first time I've ever read a papal encyclical, um, start to finish. <laughs> it's quite long, you know. And it was uh, one of the most amazing, beautifully written documents it's I've perfect. ever read. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely, it's poetry in places. Yeah. It's wonderful. Do you, do you think the other cardinals had any idea what they were doing? <laughs> when I, they, uh, <laughs> well, talking to, talking to the ones I know, yes, they absolutely did. did. And they did it very, very, yeah, like mine must say, very so, consciously. Yeah, that's great. Terrific. Matthew, well, yes, how is your... Something more than words. You know, some of the first thing he did, you know, was so striking and so simple. And it completely intensely changed your mind. When I heard that he went to a jail and washed the feet of a Muslim woman, I said, wow. Yeah. But that's something that is completely you know, out yeah. of the frame. And then I have a friend who is a scientist who goes to the Pontifical Academy of Science. He said he went for breakfast at the canteen, and he was just there eating his breakfast. Mm. And then after he was elected, he went back to pay for his room, you know, because he stayed three, three days in that mm. room where yeah. the cardinal stayed. So all these put together, you know, this is the real thing. And yeah. authenticity has a taste, and it inspires you. And I think that's why. And I also write the first time in my life an encyclical was that one. And you know, the thing about the environment was so remarkable. Some of the scientists friends yeah. I know helped him to do that, and yeah. he did open way. He probably did the most progressive statement about how to deal with animals. That yeah. was, you f takes a long hmm. time to find the same similar as strong in societies, and that industrial farming and all that is degrades our own humanity. So that's all. This is extremely inspiring and remarkable. So um, I think he has the power of reaching, you know, every human heart. He's worked within communities and understands, uh, you know, the, the problems that people, everyday people face mm -hmm. and has this tremendous capacity to be able to reach uh, human beings. Like you, I uh, read a paper encyclical for the first time mm -hmm. on climate and was very impressed. I'm just hoping to see another one on gender equality hmm. and for him to come out and say more about uh, that aspect of inequality, which is really essential. It's interesting, though, you, um, you both, in a different ways, hit on this issue, all three of you, of authenticity. Mm -hmm. There's actually a Talmudic phrase, uh, what comes from the heart enters the heart. What doesn't come from the heart doesn't enter the heart. Yes, I mean, and coherence, authenticity, Again, you know, the person has to be the living example. Otherwise, it's empty word. Do yeah. what I say, don't do yeah. what I do, and yeah. forget it. Who is interested in that? Yeah. Finish, you know? And there does seem something about this moment of time uh, in popular culture where we are bombarded with the inauthentic, the contrived. And I think he stands out even more in that time. I think you were, you were talking about millennials <clears throat> before, and I think they, more than anyone Pick else, are looking for, you know, get real. You yeah. Know, the, 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 the genuine. Absolutely, yeah. All right. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm the fourth one, of course, to, huh? to agree on authenticity and uh, walking the talk, absolutely. And, and I think a, a slightly more uh, uh, nuanced uh, uh, approach, I think, what he's doing is to be able to walk the extra mile, however hard is that. Mm -hmm. Give you an example that uh, 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 I think a few months ago, he visited Turkey. And when he was visiting the Blue Mosque, uh, there was no no obligation uh, to actually to show the kind of respect that he mm -hmm. showed to to all the Muslims right. in the entire world. He actually claps his hand, face Makkah while the mm. Imam was praying to, uh, to to God, and that was a very powerful gesture. Mm. And you know, a normal person you know would have thought thousand times before doing that extra mile, because mm. it could have been you know very controversial. It could have been you know people would have thought that that is not really that they expected from such a big leader. But he had the vision, he had the authenticity, and I think he, he had the courage to, do, to go the extra mile. But now the point is that how to reciprocate that and how to use that as, as a power to, to make, make the real impact. Now, uh, to, to give a further example, like uh, in Christianity, the human suffering is, is very important. Poverty is, is the one of the, the worst ill, and, and the same is the case with in, in all the faiths that, that we have. The human suffering is, is absolutely a part. And, and, but at the same time, I don't see in the real world the, the, the Christian, the Catholic, and all the, all the charities are working day in, day out 
all the other faiths. Save the thought because we're going to go to that at the okay. end on, on, sure. on incoming call. But um, do you do you wish Islam had a vote? I I think we. Uh, I don't know, but I think um, it's it's a different flavor altogether. Having uh, a religion, a, a faith, which which actually identifies itself and you know is is able to. Uh, reinvent itself in every generation that is equally beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, uh, having powerful mentors and the role models that is important. So, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't think that we, we really, uh, personally, I don't, I don't really miss having uh, because the role model as, as Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. is so powerful for mm -hmm. us that we we can any time relate to him to his life. Mm -hmm. It's just so living for us. Mm -hmm. So I personally, yes, I, I think that there is no need after him to, mm -hmm. to have a person like that. But I, I fully respect the, the position that uh, in, in the Catholic Church for, mm -hmm. for the Pope that he has. Thank you. Frank. Uh, you know, I, I think in this generation, more than perhaps before, it's important to be decisive in separating what is uh, prophetic from what is pathetic. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he's been a very interesting example of this. Um, just in my own life, um, I've been able to see the difference between moral authority and moral imagination. Hmm. And I believe moral imagination is going to be the only way we can really move forward in our traditions. And for me, uh, when I was in, um, uh, much younger, I uh, used to work in the music industry. And I started working with these young piano player, singer, really talented girl, quite liberal, and I was quite conservative in, in my faith. And yet, through that friendship, uh, I began to realize uh, that she made me a better Christian. Uh, because she radically accepted me in a place, I was at NYU at the time as a student while working in the music industry, and a lot of people who would hear I was Christian and conservative didn't want to talk to me. Um, and then about a year and a half into working together, she said, I'm changing my name, I'm no longer to be Stephan Stephanie Germanata, I'm now going to play under the name Lady Gaga. Hmm. And, you know, Lady hmm. Gaga helped make me a, me a better Christian. Hmm. Uh, then I worked with, a, I had a fellowship with an organization called the Interfaith Youth Corps, which is uh, seeking to make... Um, um, you know, religious compilation, a social norm. Uh, and through there, I met a, a friend of mine who became a rabbi mm. and became one of my best friends, uh, Rabbi Josh Stanton, who was inspired to become a rabbi uh, by an uh, evangelical pastor, uh, uh, mm. like a uh, chaplain at his school where he went for his undergrad. And, and then as you layer these, you know, just multiple examples of where you can be inspired from the outside and be willing to acknowledge. Some people call this holy envy. Uh, mm -hmm. Samar Simonovich, the author of... Um, uh, of, um, it's all about. It's really all about God. He mm. uses this a lot, holy envy, and I really like that. And even now, um, through the forum, I'm doing an MBA at Oxford, which is very unusual to be doing interfaith work and doing an MBA. Mm. But I find people there who take a very different approach, obviously, to life than maybe mm. I would, uh, to be inspiring me to uh, be a better Christian. And so, what I coming full circle when I grew up, the Pope was kind of equal to the Antichrist mm -hmm. in the evangelical, very conservative sure. traditions. We were taught that Catholics weren't Christian. Um, and also, it, the, it was a sort of a two-way thing where the Catholic Church didn't recognize evangelicals to be saved. And this is the first pope I've ever heard actually say that we are in the fold. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Um, and, and I think that's the, that narrative is an important few steps. Um, but, but I will also echo some of your thoughts as somebody who's a bit consequentialist minded, probably an impatient New Yorker as well. Um, I also want to see this become, uh, I want to see it solidified in concrete actions. And you do in, in some aspects of the Catholic charity work, um, but I'm, I'm hungry to see what his, his moral imagination can up, come up with and what we can dream together. You must have some amazing dinner parties. I mean, this, uh, uh, go back to Lady Gaga for a sec. How, how, uh, uh, how did she inspire you? Um, through radical acceptance, through just being a loving person and when we work together. Once again, I could go, and I was 19 at the time. I was 19, actually. I, I grew up in rural America, middle of nowhere, in the mountains between Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. Um, first generation to be educated. And so when I moved from the mountains 3,000 miles away to the village, to New York City, that was a pretty intense change. Uh, and I was surrounded by people I had never uh, engaged with. I had my first real conversation with a Muslim, with a Catholic, with a Jew, mm. with a gay person. This was quite discombobulating. And some of those conversations actually led me to, to, to founding World Faith. But when I would enter some of these circles, some of these conversations, there'd be a lot of young, very liberal students who would just be like, no, uh, I, won't, I won't talk to you. And I remember this now as a person who maybe can seem liberal within the evangelical community, hmm. how it feels to be told that you're, like, that you're not good enough in that sense. And so I, I want to 
convey my passion on those things, but do so lovingly, uh, because that's what I experienced that was revolutionary for me. So for her, she knew my politics, she knew my mm. faith and my beliefs, and where we contradicted. We didn't not talk about it, but at no point did we not, we had a bigger dream of what we can accomplish together, mm. uh, and that was to change the music industry, and I think we were able to, to do some of that, only because we had the moral imagination and the acceptance, and then the rest of it sort of worked itself out. Um, one of the themes, uh, and um, Professor Ibrahim just touched it now, that certainly here in Davos is everywhere, uh, income inequality. Um, what can the faith communities do besides this the standard charity? I mean, this seems now to be a global epidemic. How can faith be part of the, faith communities be a part of the solution to income inequality? Archbishop, start us off. First, by example, that we need those who follow Christ to be themselves uh, sacrificial in the way they live their lives. Mm. Secondly, by exhortation, to bring people back to the faith, face of Jesus Christ, who was, in Christian teaching, made himself poor so that the world could find the riches of God. Thirdly, uh, by, um, to lapse from the high-flown rhetoric, um, by persistent nagging, <laughs> Um, and persistent reminder of, of what it means. I, we lived for, I was in the oil industry for 11 years and was group treasurer of a big oil company and then went off and got ordained. And uh, a lot of my ministry was in parishes and uh, the cathedral for that matter, but in really some of the poorest parts of the UK. And um, you saw the effect of income inequality. Mm. You saw the effect of, as of someone said to me, the trouble is, Justin, the month is always just a little longer than the money. Mm. Mm. That's income inequality. Yeah. And that lives, if that, if you allow that to burn itself deeply enough into your heart, which you must, then you can then the churches can speak with a prophetic edge. I love what Frank's been saying again. A prophetic edge, speaking from being present in and with the poor, the places of poverty, but with them, not doing stuff for them, to them, but with them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, the Dalai Lama often says that he's half Buddhist, half Marxist. So for <laughs> someone whose country has been invaded by yeah. Mao, Mao and one million people by died. full Marxist, not half Marxist. Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. that's a you know, mm -hmm. far-fetched statement. And of course, it doesn't mean about sure. you know, 15 million dead in, 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 in the China and the yeah. same amount in, in Russia. What it means is this ideal of being together, of, of sharing, of reducing precisely those privileges and inequalities. And so, in his mind, I think the, it is definitely a, a, a problem, and I think inequality, again, is not just about income, it's about inclusion, mm -hmm. it's about really, you know, in, in those societies, in Nepal and India as well, when you address a woman, it's either a mother, elder sister, or younger sister, same for men. You know, so it, this is kind of idea of a very close, sort of everyone is part of a kind of family. So that idea is, of course, closer to equalitarian societies than to society of privilege and individualism and so forth. So in that sense, we know that inequality is one of the main challenges of our times. It's bad for everything, for health, for longevity, for quality of education, and so forth. So it is one of our main goals. Mm -hmm. And I think this is somehow rooted with this exacerbated individualism. Mm -hmm. you know. Work hard, you will be rich, and then you know, others have to do the same, you know, mm -hmm. even they are in no access to education. Mm -hmm. and, mother with five kids and no father, and how can you expect that just working hard they will yeah. get out of, of the hole? So the solidarity is really something that is, we need to revive, you know, cooperation, solidarity, and being together. Martin Luther King said we came on different vessels, we're on the same boat, so the more the world is so-called global, the more that interdependence is, is blatant and needs to be taken in account. Yes. Is, is so obvious that yeah. we need to take into account that uh, we are all of the same human families and mm -hmm. we cannot uh, you know, get out of that and yeah. just go just for oneself. 
Thank you. Stugo. So um, I think technical solutions and economic solutions like re redistribution of wealth, et cetera, are important. And, but in addition to that, we need um, sustainable solutions that speak to um, you know, the spiritual um, values that you, you started off by saying, yes, the goodness and the generosity and all, but without those, we will not have sustained change and there can be no transformation. And I think for all of us to be able to understand that, that there is no other, we are all in this together, mm. it's one world. And until we really embrace the understanding of the oneness of mankind, that we are not going to have that transformation. It's not about a small group of people uplifting another, that's not what development is about. It's about building a capacity for all individuals mm -hmm. And access to knowledge is really important, and to be able to um, use that knowledge mm -hmm. in uh, sustained change in one's life. So, I think it's it's a much bigger task than what we discuss at the World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. But we need to look beyond that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is exactly what we need to discuss at the World Economic Forum, and we are right in the middle of where things can actually relate to some actions. And uh, I give you an example. Uh, in Mecca, uh, during Ramadan, one, over one million people share meals two times a day. And that is phenomenal. And that is not the only place in, in, in the entire Muslim world. Every mosque, there is food that, that comes, and nobody knows where that is coming from. So the, the charitable actions in all the faiths, mm -hmm. they are happening beyond anybody's imagination. <laughs> is that important? Of course, that is very important. Is that helping? Partly. But I think uh, what, what may be missing is to see that we are living in the age of institutionalizations, in the age where things are specialized, in the age where things are being enabled. If you look at the, the past through two, three G20 meetings, B20 meetings, everything is all about inclusive growth. The private sector has realized that the, the massive growth is going to come from the people who are underserved. And that is exactly the kind of approach the faiths need to look at that if they need to be relevant, they, they need to go out where exactly the people actually need their support. So we are living in the age where enabling digitization is, is, is very important as an enabler. So faith as an inspirational enabler, that's very important. Faith as an ideological enabler, that's absolutely important. But faith as a financial enabler, I think that is something that we need to perhaps consider and focus on. Because that is where the synergies at the common ground to, to meet and, and try to to actually capture the issue can, can actually happen. And now, as, as I was mentioning earlier, the, the charities are, are massively working in human relief efforts, the, the giving food and, and medical supplies, everything is happening. But there is no institutionalization of the, of the charity to enable that people do not survive or, or continue to look for aid. People so can, they can be self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think faith is now, is very important for the faith to stay relevant. To, to actually support SMEs, mm -hmm. to support uh, microfinance institutions, mm -hmm. to support investment banks who are actually looking at, at, at the impact sector. So I think that is the kind of approach perhaps faith need to, need to look at to, to stay more relevant. And I think within this room, there is, there is enough critical mass to, to have a consensus that this is something that, that, that is perhaps faiths are not doing, and this is something perhaps faith should be doing. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, Frank, I'm gonna give you the last word. We'll have to close with this. Sure. Um, you know, it's a fascinating division in the evangelical community right now uh, because when you look at supporting global poverty initiatives, um, the Christian community, particularly a lot of evangelicals in the U.S., support hugely in small donations. And it's a, something I, I take as, a, I, I say with pride, that global poverty is something that's very important uh, to my community. There is, however, voices uh, from within the community who talk about, uh, who sort of support this more conservative narrative of, of poor people being like bad people. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, might, it makes me think of Anne Lamont with her wise words of, um, you, you're sure, you can be sure that you've made God in your image if God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. you know, when you hear some of this vilifi uh, like vilification of those who have not in America right now, it sort of, it looks a little like we're trying to rewrite our theology, mm -hmm. yeah. but like Jesus's words on poverty is pretty explicit. Mm -hmm. um, so, it presents an opportunity right now, and we have good and bad. And I think what's needed in the next step, where we're moving forward, 
is our faith traditions um, and belief traditions for non-religious people as well, uh, that gives us a really good why. Um, humanism makes a great case, good without God, that you can go do good things. Um, uh, Chris Stedman, who's uh, the Harvardist, uh, Harvard, no, excuse me, uh, Yale chaplain for humanists, mm. uh, has just done a lot of great work in sort of making, a, going out and saying, here's how we can build a framework to go do this work and volunteer and all this, and, and, and even partner in this type of work. And I think what we need now is once we have these whys, we need the hows. So I'd love to see more inspired uh, people with this vision uh, with these convictions to go, you know, to become economists, to become mm -hmm. working, to build, to be inspired, but use the best technology, the best science, the best research. Scale it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the why, as an interfaith leader, I'm doing an MBA at Oxford Said right now. It's a very bizarre thing to do, but like, yeah. I think this is, I, I, I want to see more of this in the next generation. Terrific. Cross collaboration, people doing different things. I think it's a really exciting time. We're the first generation that has the resources, the people, and the ideas to end all of our problems. We've had the technology yeah. to kill mankind since mm -hmm. 60 years ago, yeah. but we're the first that can actually solve it. Now, will we have the moral imagination yeah. to do so? That, that we'll just have to see. I'm stealing that too. Yeah. Uh, we we can just write a blog much. together, <laughs> let's do that. This has been a wonderful panel. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.